Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, good to see everybody out here. Uh, first off, I would like to uh, give a special thanks to Lenaro for inviting me to uh, come up here and give this talk to you today. Uh, the ideas for this have kind of been bouncing around in my head for a few years, so it feels good for them to finally be able to get out. And actually, really quick uh, about myself. I, I've been at uh, Qualcomm Innovation Center for over 10 years now. I've been working primarily in the Linux kernel domain and primarily on Spartan phones. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking to you about today is coming a, a lot from that perspective. So what do I mean by the upstream bubble, right? So a lot of you may be familiar with the concept of being in a bubble, right? It's, it's the idea of having a, a constrained environment, having some limitations on it. Those limitations could be really kind of uh, anything in nature. They could be uh, limitations on your interactions, limitations on your perceptions. But the idea is that there's some kind of boundary there, right? And, and you can take this analogy uh, a little bit further, at least in, in how I think about it, how it applies to the upstream community, the, the downstream community, and SOC vendors. Uh, a bubble itself can, uh, can be kind of translucent. You can see beyond it. So people that are inside these domains, they can also they can see kind of things in other domains outside of that, but they generally don't interact with those other domains because they have those kind of boundaries and those limitations. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why is the case? Why does this happen with, uh, with open source projects, uh, downstream uh, product focused companies, and things like that? So uh, some of you may see this statement and think, all right, yes, absolutely, I, I agree with that. That makes sense. The, the, that's, that's kind of how things are. But some of you may also see this and think, well, wait a minute, uh, I don't like that. That's not really a good thing. It really shouldn't be that way. Um, kind of based on my experience, I tend to fall in, in the former camp. And I wanted to sp spend a bit of time kind of explaining that. Um, smartphones, just kind of by the nature of, of the market they're in, the nature of the products, they, they tend to move very, very fast. I mean, every year, You've got a new smartphone device uh, with the latest and greatest hardware coming out in it. And the life cycle for these devices is not really that long in the overall time frame of things, right? Um, people are going to buy a new device you know, every two, three years, or sometimes less if you kind of drop it and crack the screen or something. But, but the, the whole idea there is when you're buying a, buying, buying a new device, you're buying something that is you know, one, two, or sometimes more cases, generations beyond what you previously had. There's kind of less need, less opportunity for continuity there. And then that presents uh, kind of some unique challenges. Um, one of the other things that's, to me, really kind of interesting about the smartphone market in particular, um, which is, I, I think, brought into some kind of contrast when, when dealing with the, with the open source community is just this idea about how the 80-20 the rule applies to smartphones. So if, if you're not familiar with that, the, the general idea is that you know, smartphones will have a, a given set of product requirements. Here's the full set of things that you need to support a, to support a device. And the 80-20 the rule kind of applies to that in that you can spend roughly about 20% of your effort to get to about 80% of your output, 80% of your goal for those requirements. And for a lot of market segments, you know, that level of functionality may be OK. And even for open source projects like the, like the Linux kernel, that level of functionality may be OK, because once you get beyond that point, you're spending the, 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 the remaining 80% of your effort to get that extra 20% uh, of, uh, of output for it. So it's, it's kind of a point of diminishing returns. But uh, on the commercial, on the market side, the, the, that's really kind of demanded of products to be able to get to those really high levels of power optimization, of performance, of user experience, and of kind of stability in the products. And, and that kind of uh, input to the product actually really adds a lot of value to it. It, it brings a lot of kind of advanced problem solving, advanced techniques that uh, are sometimes kind of problematic uh, when, when dealing with uh, open source software. So what is the kind of size of the problem I'm, I'm talking about? Um, several years ago, I think it was actually at a Lenaro Connect event, uh, there was a speaker that got up and said, SOC vendors have you know, a million lines of code downstream in their product trees. And, th and that's kind of a problem. 
And kind of ever since that point, I've been kind of keeping uh, track of that metric, keeping an eye on it. And so when I went and looked back, you know, roughly five years ago, I measured really the number of lines of code that we had to put on top of an upstream kernel to get a product functional. And, and sure enough, uh, the number for us was, you know, over a million lines of code. Uh, it's been 1.2, 1.4 million lines of code, but it's fairly significant. Over the same kind of five-year time span, we've been putting uh, a lot of effort into getting our SOC supported upstream, right? So I went back and measured uh, contributions from Code Aurora Forum, which, uh, which submits uh, support for SOCs. There have been almost 400,000 lines of code submitted in that time frame. And that number doesn't even include contributions from uh, partners such as Lenaro or, or from other kind of community members that, that would support our architecture. So if you come back to today, you might think five years ago, 100,000 lines of code, 400,000 have gone upstream. We should be roughly at you know, 600,000 lines of code, if I can do that math, right? But when, when you look at it today, I measure this, we're still over a million lines of code downstream. And that was a really interesting outcome to me. Why, why is that the case? And to me, it's kind of indicating that the effort there is not translating at least directly or at least not at the pace that we might like into reducing the, this, this amount of code uh, that's in our downstream product kernels. So when I started thinking about this, there's kind of several reasons for that. On, on the hardware side, uh, yes, there's also, there is generally a lack of uh, just general device support, things like device drivers and things of that nature. Uh, but I think there's also kind of a, a more fundamental uh, issue at play here. Uh, one of the really great things about uh, ARM devices in the ARM ecosystem is that you can take a lot of different components and you can build anything from a very small, very uh, deeply embedded kind of device all the way up to an exascale kind of computer as we saw there. But conversely, that's also one of the maybe not so good things about uh, the ARM ecosystem because there's an incredible amount of variety and complexity that, that can come into building these different systems. And fundamentally, uh, one of the challenges here is that there is not a kind of unifying, standardized, required system architecture that, that comes along with it. There's reference designs, there's specifications, there's best practices, but really at the end of the day, you can build an ARM system that looks uh, very, very different uh, from uh, competitors in its category, and, and there's a still very good ARM system. So there's a lot of challenges there in being able to support these wide variety of devices with these wide variety of components connected in a wide variety of ways out of, out of a common uh, source base on things. Um, on the software side, there's also a lot of challenges on, on the upstream side. Um, and, and smartphones, for me, bring this uh, in, into, uh, again, really high contrast. I, I enjoy working in, in the smartphone market because, uh, at least on the software side, you, you deal with a very broad and, and a very divergent range of requirements, right? So w when you buy a brand new device, a lot of times you're spending a, a lot of money on it. You want the, the best possible performance on it. In some cases, you expect like almost kind of desktop class performance on it. You want very good multimedia, you want very good uh, user experience on it. So there's a lot of expectations just on the performance side. Uh, conversely, you know, these devices are handheld, they're battery powered. When you buy a device, you don't want to spend, you end up recharging the battery every half hour. You want the battery to last one day, two days, multiple days beyond that. And when, when these kinds of things, these kind of challenges are you know, presented to software, uh, the, the techniques that you have to employ to kind of satisfy that, that wide range of things uh, can be fairly, uh, fairly difficult, fairly complex to do. And there's even further challenges, like on the physical side. These are very small, kind of constrained devices. Um, they've got limitations on the thermal side. Um, there's not a lot of mass there for them to dissipate heat and things like that. You don't want the devices in their hand. All these things kind of come into play. And these aren't just hardware problems. These are problems you have to deal with on the software side. So if you take some of these kind of advanced requirements and you look at how easy, how easy is it to support these uh, in, in upstream projects like the Linux kernel, I tend to find that it's actually fairly difficult. 
Um, a, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the current designs in these projects are based around other architectures, and so they're not really uh, kind of designed with uh, with these kind of uh, ARM or smartphone kind of requirements in mind. And, and getting some of these advanced features to be sort of, to be supported there is is really kind of uh, an, an uphill battle at times. There's a lot of work that has to go into it, and I think. It, it's, we're, st we're still a far distance away from, from having those kinds of capabilities supported out of the box. Um, and smartphones have other kind of challenges as well. Um, these days you're seeing uh, every new device come, is coming out as having multiple cameras in them, you know, versus a few years ago you didn't have that. So the multimedia capabilities are, are continuing to expand. That, that places a lot of uh, demands on internal system architecture in terms of things like memory bandwidth and uh, latency for, for things like system response. Um, if you've been following Qualcomm lately, you may have also heard of this thing called 5G. Uh, that, that's going to be uh, coming fairly soon to a device near you. Um, it's going to be uh, the next generation of cellular networks. but. Uh, the devices are, are out there supporting it now, are, are coming out to market now, and so 5G itself is is more than just uh, you know a simple uh, speed increase. It's going to bring uh, a lot of advanced new capabilities to devices. Uh, the speed increases are definitely going to be there, but there's also uh, going to be an overall kind of reduction in uh, transmission latency on the system. So when you when you bring this into software. Uh, there's going to be a lot more challenges in dealing with data flowing through the system. Um, we already have challenges on, on the 4G side, so it's going to get even, even further complicated there. So I think on the networking side, um, there's going to be a, a lot more challenges in dealing with high throughput kind of data rates in, in these devices. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about specifications. So. For the most part, specifications are very good things, right? Um, there's a specific problem. People think about solving it. They create a, an idea for it, a design for it. They come up with uh, specifications, interfaces for it. That, that's a good thing. Uh, but these can also be dangerous, uh, in my opinion, in, in certain kinds of scenarios. And, and the danger to me comes when specifications are treated as standards. And when, when somebody's making the decision, all right, this specification is going to be the, the standard, what you're really kind of saying is, this is the best and one and only kind of way of solving that kind of problem. And when you're making that kind of decision, there, there are kind of implications to doing that. Um, specifications themselves can be kind of out of sync with product cycles. Um, products, you know, have to move very frequently and get out to market. And those problems may be solved in very specific ways, and then later on a specification can come out that can address a similar problem. Uh, this kind of thing actually happened to Qualcomm uh, when we first moved to 64-bit chips, right? We made our chips, we put our software out there, uh, we, were, we were very happy with them. Uh, at some point later on we said, hey, we thought it would be a great idea to get these chips supported in the upstream kernel so that we can start you know, being better uh, open source citizens. When we went out to do that, we sent our, essentially sent our power management code out. Uh, people looked at it and said, mm, no, no thanks, we're not interested in that. Um, and, and as we kind of got into that, we kind of realized that uh, um, Qualcomm essentially really didn't get the memo on this one, that the community was you know, focusing on PSCI as a power management interface. And, and uh, that there's certainly very good reasons to do that, but for this particular case, uh, the, the end result was of, of that for us was that our, really our first generation of 64-bit processors really had no path to having power management supported in, in the upstream community for that. Um, that kind of thing has been addressed kind of going forward, but those kinds of things to me can be kind of challenging when coming from a downstream perspective. Okay. So on the downstream side, we actually have a lot of challenges ourselves as well, right? Um, because of the market that we're in, uh, timing is, is, is fairly critical for us. So if, if you take the case where somebody decides, I really do want to have uh, an upstream feature, an upstream driver supported in my product, um, if, if 
if that particular thing is present when you start using that kernel, great, you're, you're in a pretty good situation. But if you have to do the work to get that kind of thing upstream, then there's going to be problems because the upstream process, at least for the Linux kernel side, is not deterministic at all, right? You can't build a product schedule and say, I, I know on this date that this feature is going to be in Linus's tree. There's, there's many other things that can come into play. Um, a good kind of example of this is just the, the, the big little scheduler from ARM. Um, I, th I think there's been many uh, schedules for that to, to be done and completed, and they were all roughly in the next year time frame. And at the end of the day, ARM spent many, many years working on that, getting it done. It was a good overall outcome. But uh, looking back in the beginning, I'm not, I'm not sure that they could say you, you know, definitively it would be a certain functionality at a certain date. And that's kind of hard when you want to go plan things from a product perspective. Um, there's actually a lot of cost concerns on, uh, on the downstream on the product side. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of kind of leverage with you. So it, as engineers, when we have a problem to solve, you know, a typical way of doing that would be take something that is already kind of existing close to what you want, modify it, extend it, you know, add things, remove things, that kind of thing, right? Uh, we all kind of do that. Uh, hardware engineers do this too. So this manifests itself kind of within Qualcomm, uh, in, on the hardware side at least. Uh, we end up with a, a set of chips, uh, SOCs, that are kind of similar in functionality but all slightly different in some way. And we tend to refer to these kind of a, as a group or a family of chips. So the, the, the first generation of these is the one that gets the, the huge significant effort in investment on the hardware and on the software side. And then subsequent uh, revisions of them will be minor tweaks, you know, increase the frequency, take out a hardware block, add a hardware block. But the idea for doing that is you do uh, targeted investment on the hardware side, you manage cost, you manage time, get a product out quicker. The same kind of expectation is there on the software side, right? So when you're going to make these derivative chips, the, the, the idea is you know, we're going to go change the software just where we need it and in a very targeted way. We are not going to do a wholesale redesign of the software just to get us back up to the point we are now. Um, but this, this can have some challenges in, in other ways. So the, the, the hardware blocks themselves are, are fairly easy to you know, port over between SOC and uh, SOC, right? But the software can have different kind of requirements. Uh, at very least, based on timing, you might have to support something in, in a different kernel version. So already the software has to change a little bit just because the kernel itself is changing. Um, there's another kind of interesting thing uh, I've run into on the downstream side. And it's, it's this concept that um, upstream is kind of an all or nothing proposition. And when I first ran into this on the downstream side, I, I was a little taken aback. This is not something I was expecting to see. But I, I, I started seeing it repeatedly. So to me, this was not an anomaly, not really kind of an exception case. There's a really, there's a, a very real kind of perception that, you know, that this is how things are. So to explain this to you, um, we have teams internally that kind of are responsible for very focused areas. They've got a, they've got a hardware area. Uh, that that's their responsibility. They, they make it work on the software side. They're responsible for firmware. They're responsible for drivers, libraries, frameworks, middleware, everything. That's the area they own it. When these, these kinds of families of chips come in and this leverage story comes in, that, that hardware block goes over to another device. They've got the expectation that their software, which they, which is, well, that's going to go over exactly with it as well. The hardware itself internally is not changing, so the software should kind of work as is. Uh, and so for the most part, you, you, said you see that uh, behavior a lot. Um, but when you, when you go to these teams and you say, all right, let's get this, this piece of hardware supported in the upstream project, um, they, they have a different perspective on it. So they, they view it as a complete separate other thing that has to be supported. And the difficulty for them is they, they, they pull out their, their feature description list, basically, and they say, all right, my, on the downstream product side, I've got this hundred things that I need to do in software to meet all my product requirements. And then they go pull up the upstream side of it, and, and in a lot of cases, there's something that's existing there that you know, works you know, on their hardware block or something similar for it, but the software story is completely different. 
they, they, they do their investigation and the, the functionality tends to be very different. So when they do their, their, their line by line checklist comparison, the upstream side is missing you know, a lot of advanced features for the hardware block. They're missing a lot of power management features. They're missing a lot of performance optimizations. They're missing debug capabilities. And that actually becomes a, a real problem for them because there's no easy way for them to say, all right, we're going to do this work and then we'll be able to use that in a product anytime soon. So when they look at the upstream side, they look at it as we have to maintain our, our downstream product side and have, maintain our full investment there. But if we need to go support the upstream side of it as well, now we're doing kind of a parallel, almost kind of duplicate effort to support the same hardware but with a completely different software base. And if you add that into the add in the challenges of kind of timing, having you know, no real deterministic way to know when some of these features are going to be available, it almost becomes an intractable problem for them. So uh, how, do you get, how do you deal with something like that? How do you get started on that? Um, so a, a few years ago, uh, one of the engineers on our team and I sat down and, and asked the question, what would it really kind of take to get one of our SOCs fully supported upstream with this full set of product requirements. Uh, and this diagram is not any particular SOC. It's not 100% accurate. Um, but it's, it's a reasonable representation of the kinds of things that we would need to do. So we sketched out a whole bunch of dependencies. This driver needs that driver. These areas are going to have problems. And the end result uh, basically came up with this kind of spaghetti diagram. So just to give you some context for this, uh, this is basically a, a functional kind of dependency graph where uh, you know, driver A you know, enables functionality needed by driver B. And I color coded the nodes kind of based on fan out. Darker colors mean higher fan out means more things are blocking them. Those are kind of the, the choke points. But then I went back and circled in red. All right, these, these are areas where we know in the upstream community that this particular feature is not supported and we'd have to add it. Or we've tried to add it and the maintainer said, no, we don't like that or that functionality really doesn't exist at all. We'd have to create an entirely new way of, of dealing with things. But essentially, this, this kind of gave us a, a way to break down the problem and, and approach it. So um, on, on the positive side, we ended up doing this you know, right before one of these kind of connect conferences. And I, I came in and said, all right, we've, we've got this problem with bus scaling. This is kind of... Uh, a problem that we've solved downstream, it's unique to us, but maybe, maybe others might have some benefit from it. So we talked to some various people at Lenaro, and uh, with, with their help, uh, they, they kind of engaged with us, worked with us on it. With their help, we were able to kind of uh, get started down the path to something that led towards the interconnect framework. Uh, that was several years ago, and then that work is still kind of ongoing, but there was a good outcome there for us. So, the other part of the plan that we came up with, we decided, all right, let's not go chase an individual SOC at any given time because we're never really kind of going to get there if needed. Let's, let's tackle the, the software requirement pieces and, and get those enabled in the community because those are going to be the really difficult ones and those are going to be the ones where if they're solved later on, we can take individual uh, drivers and those are much, much more straightforward to get upstream. So, our approach has really been focus on frameworks, focus on software features, and then from there, the rest of the things should hopefully kind of get easier over time. Uh, on the downstream side, so companies, uh, at least companies like Qualcomm, behave much differently than uh, open source projects and upstream communities behave, right? So I think one of the challenges for uh, companies that want to engage like that is to have somebody that kind of can understand the external perspective, how they operate, but also understand how uh, your company operates internally. And, and basically what they should be doing is removing obstacles for participation, removing barriers. Uh, to give you an example of this, a few years ago, Linux kernel community started switching over to SPDX identifiers for, for legal markings, right? So we were you know, paying attention to things. We saw that happening. This, this seemed like a good thing. We knew within one or two product generations, we would be at that point where we'd be using a uh, kernel with new product markings on it. So, uh, so what I did is I actually went out and talked to our lawyers and showed them, hey, look, here's what SPDX identifiers are. Here's what they mean from a legal context. Here's why it's not a big, scary thing. They looked at it and said, yeah, that's reasonable. Sounds good. 
So the next thing I had to do was go back to our internal compliance teams and tell them, you know, not today, but in the, in the near future, you're going to start seeing products showing up with that, that are marked differently than, than what you have now. So um, you don't have to worry about this, uh, but you should be prepared to update your processes, update your tooling, and if you have any questions, oh, go by, the, by the way, go talk to the lawyers. They're, they're cool with it. And then from there, uh, to, 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 to uh, continue this on, I had to go back and make actual product plans. I had to go train our engineering teams on, on how to do this. You know, pick a point where we're going to start doing this, tell people what it means, how to do it, show them kind of before and after pictures, and then and really get our entire engineering organization you know, up to speed on, on how to do that. So I think having somebody to do that is, is really important in the downstream organizations. At, at least for me, I find cases of this nature kind of come, coming up almost on a monthly basis. Um, another uh, really kind of vital thing on, on the downstream side is really just your overall mindset for open source. Um, at, at, as a hiring manager, I will a lot of times take note of people that have kind of gone out of their way to participate in uh, open source projects or open source communities to some extent. Because to me, it, it demonstrates uh, the, the ability and willingness to, to do that kind of thing, which is important for uh, companies like ours who want to operate more in that way. So I think it's, it's a good thing to have there. And if you have those kind of people inside your company, they can help others also learn those kinds of skills. Um, but there's also kind of a, kind of a counterpoint example there. Um, there are people uh, I found in our company that really don't want anything at all to do with the open source community, or there's people that where I, I think they would be really good at it, and I want them to go do something, ask them about it, and they're really just not interested at all. And that to me is kind of a curious thing because they, they work on open source software in, the da in their daily job, but they're less interested in engaging with the community. So when I started digging in, into that a little bit, it, it came down to a problem of recognition. So companies, uh, at least like Qualcomm, were highly product focused. We recognize uh, and reward things that are kind of product focused as well. And when, when I first heard that, I was, uh, I was taken aback a little bit because I thought, all right, I, I value this, uh, our team values this, I know my boss uh, values it as well because he's kind of on me on, on a repeated basis to get, do more in this area. Uh, but the more and more I thought about it, I, I recognize that it, it's a bit broader than that. It's, it's, not about, uh, it's not about one particular group or one particular manager. It's, it's really more about uh, your kind of corporate culture and how they deal with it. For the individual engineers, um, they don't see uh, they don't see recognition from their peers for this kind of activity, and and that's kind of a big that, that's that's a really important thing I think because to really uh, kind of do well in open source and communities it needs to be valued and recognized uh, just in, in a similar way to the to, to products as well. And and on that front I think uh Lonaro has been kind of tremendously uh, useful for us it's it's one of the things i really appreciate and value uh, about Lonaro um kind of almost universally across the organization from the engineers to the managers from the leadership team uh they sincerely want uh, to engage with their members engage with the community and help their members uh, be better open source citizens and and that is tremendous value it, to me it helps uh, address not just you know, individual items, but also address the, the kind of mindset issues, the kind of corporate culture problems. It helps essentially kind of bridge the gap be between uh, these kind of communities on things. And I'm really appreciative of Lenar for that. So I, I wanted to share this, this quote with everybody because uh, I, I found this as, as, as a really kind of a good example of, of what I'm talking about today. So this came to me kind of unsolicited from one of the engineers uh, within an adjacent group in our company. And to me, it kind of really highlighted how um, when he first started out, uh, he started out with open source, he had his own kind of uh, preconceptions about what the community would be like, how in interacting with them would be. But with uh, some help and some, of, some kind of partnership from Lenaro, um, he was able to actually see beyond uh, just his own environment, see how, how things uh, are different in the upstream side, 
and it really made a very positive uh, impact on him and the team. And, and for that, I think it's really good. To me, that was, a, that was one good solid example. So kind of to that end, I, I know there's a lot of uh, Qualcomm engineers in the room today, uh, some students as well. And so I wanted to give you a bit of a challenge. So for, for those of you that have not worked uh, directly with the community yet, not interacted with an open source project, have not been out to a conference like this before, I, I wanted to encourage you to actually go out and, and, and make a connection with somebody outside of your group, outside of your company. Find somebody that, that works in an area that you, that you work on or works in an area that you're interested in and, and just uh, uh, introduce yourself, ask them a question, ask you know, what's interesting in their area, what's challenging in their area, what's it like working with the community, what's it like working with companies. But if, if you can take that, that first step towards uh, getting out of your kind of comfort, comfort zone, it, it'll go a long way towards, uh, towards uh, build, changing this kind of culture and building this overall better mindset, I think. Uh, and when, when you do those kinds of things, at least, uh, at least in my experience. Um, when, when engineers kind of come together, when they can talk openly uh, and collaboratively, collaboratively about uh, uh, the kind of common problems that they face, the overall outcomes are much better. I, I've seen numerous examples where you know, people on, on, on the downstream side have talk, discussed something with Lenaro, with the community, and the end result for them has been overall much better. And on the upstream side, I've I've seen a lot of cases where there are things the upstream side wasn't considering. There were uh, new features or capabilities they, 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 they weren't considering. So I think this kind of interaction is, is extremely valuable, uh, not just for uh, an individual company, but uh, to help kind of bridge the gap between the communities and help uh, produce better overall results for uh, both uh, downstream focused companies and for the community as, Ill, the community as a whole. So with that, that's the end of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff.